Shares for beginners. Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. Investing is a baseball game where there are no strikes. Right? It, it, it can give you Amazon at X price. It can give you Microsoft at Y price. And you can just stand there with your capital. You have to do nothing. And when Mr. Market is really depressed, that's when you swing. Hi, and welcome back to Stocks for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatillo. What are the core tenets of value investing? What are the investment philosophies handed down on stone tablets by the likes of Buffett, Graham and Munger? Is their syllabus still relevant? Today, I'm joined by the Value Punks to look at this and more. Hello, Dayan Balka. Hi, Phil. Hi, Phil. Value Punks write about good and actionable stock ideas in a way that educates, informs and importantly helps build conviction. And we will be covering conviction today. Value Punks was founded by Balka Sivia and Dei Deng, two buy-side equity analysts who believe that independent institutional grade equity research should be accessible to all investors. So tell us a bit about your background, where you guys came from. Who wants to go first? Sure. I'm Day. Uh, I've been investing uh, professionally for the last 10 years or so. And uh, most of these years were spent as a uh, equity research analyst on, on the buy side. And uh, right now I'm a portfolio manager and managing client capital. And mostly that, that those are high net worth individuals. Yeah. And Belka? Hi, uh, my name is Balkar Sivia. Uh, I'm from Toronto, Canada. I have a background, I actually graduated as an engineer, and I fell into love with stocks and stock investing. Uh, and I was young enough in my career to make the switch. So I, um, in the beginning, I was mostly self-taught. But since 2010, I have been investing professionally in buy-side firms. In 2021, I took the leap and uh, founded my own firm, uh, White Falcon Capital, where it's a investment partnership kind of based on Buffett's principles. And, you know, th- there are some synergies uh, and some commonalities in, in running and, and writing for value punks. So the things that I own and hold in White Falcon are some of the things that we talk about. Uh, in in value punks and the ideas that we have there. So where did the name come from? Are you uh, Clint Eastwood fans or punk music fans? <laughs> yeah, it was, there's a there's a, a not so serious version and a more serious version. You know, the not so serious version just being. Uh, you, you, I, I'm assuming everyone knows what a crypto crypto punks are, right? These mm-hmm. are uh, NFTs, and uh, we just kind of thought it's hilarious the fact that we found a you know, a Warren Buffett NFT, because if you kind of think about it, these are two very different, uh, almost polar opposites, right? You got the most uh, uh, prudent investor uh, uh, on one side with an NFT is totally crazy subculture, (laughs) Uh, Uh, right? So, so that was kind of funny, but, but I guess a more serious uh, answer would be that uh, we, we, Balkar and I, both of us, we kind of started our careers. We used to be colleagues at the same company and this was a, I'd say a pretty conservatively run uh, buy side firm managing a lot of uh, money for endowments, uh, you know, uh, just conservative clients, right? And w- there was a big focus on studying uh, the work of Warren Buffett. So we that that was kind of our starting point. But over time, you know, one thing that Warren Buffett really emphasizes is this concept of. Uh, circle of competence, right? He invests within that circle, the circle of what you know. And um, Balkar and I were, were young and kind of foolish enough to uh, try to push that circle, if you will. So, so that is where the, the, the punk side <laughs> of us come, comes, comes in. And um, you, so, you were feeling lucky punks, were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny, just um, I've spoken, one of the things that comes up in uh, this podcast is people say that engineers are not very good at becoming investors because of that concrete mindset that they have, which doesn't really take into account the emotions that are inherent in the stock market. No, that's true. But engineers are confident a bunch and they think, you know, they can do things better than than somebody else. Uh, mm. And, you know, in the beginning, as a junior analyst, you know, this this is more science than art, mm. but over time this becomes more art than science. And I think I've had to learn and adapt all those different attributes. Okay, so let's talk about what value investing is. Where did it come from? What's its history? And why does it mean so much to you? 
Yeah, so we would consider ourselves as value investors, right? And I think you'll probably hear uh, many people say they're value investors, and maybe that means something different to you know different people, right? Maybe even between Balcar and I, we we could kind of interpret that perhaps a little differently between us as well. I would say just just from my perspective, what value investors are, I think there's one key defining trait of what makes a value investor, which is I think value investors really start from what they don't know as opposed to what, what they know. And so that is really, uh, you know, in particular, there's a, there, there's a belief that the world is really complicated, complex. Things are inherently unforecastable. You cannot predict things. And so that is kind of the philosophical underpinning of this whole thing the starting point for being a value investor. So most you would hear describe value investing as something like you you buy a dollar for 50 cents. And that's kind of the concept that was originally, it came from uh, Ben Graham, right? In my opinion, right? It's not about buying that dollar for 50 cents because you think that 50 cents would eventually become a dollar. I mean, that is a part of, you know, the return equation, but the more important part i think is that you by doing that you create a buffer for your own ignorance and uh, sometimes people call that a margin of safety but the idea is you want to protect downside uh even in the case when you're wrong so that you you don't go through the kind of you know 80 90 percent drawdowns and that that is i think the real reason why you want to buy a dollar for 50 cents balka did you want to add to that yeah, you know, just to just to add to it, you know, again, value investing has evolved over time, right? I mean, there, I mean, Graham, as they saying, buying dollars for fifty cents, you know, that was value investing, and then Buffett buying Coke became value investing, and today people are buying high tech growth stocks and calling it value investing, right? I think again, different people can have different definitions of value investing, but I think the core is that you're buying something where the expectations are so low that you know anything incrementally positive is good for you, gives you a return. And something incrementally negative, hopefully is all priced in and doesn't affect you on the downside. Because again, if somebody is buying a stock that, that's growing at 50% a year and at 10 times earnings or 20 times earnings, you know that's value investing also, right? Different people interpret it different ways, but I'd say it's getting more than what you're paying. And hopefully the expectations in that stock are at a point where, you know, any incremental positive news can only help you. Well, so you're you're coming from a position of pessimism then? Most value investors are not optimists. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think we have worked around, you know, enough value investors to kind of say that. I mean, for the longest time, they didn't invest in technology stocks, right? Because to invest in technology stocks, mm. you have to believe that things are getting better or will get better, that these companies that are not producing any earnings will produce earnings. You know, you know, value investors typically don't do any of that. They just say, this is an industrial company that was making X amount of earnings in the last up cycle. Uh, they have all these assets. I'm just paying for the assets, right? I don't know what the earnings are going to be next year because I can't really forecast. But when the next up cycle comes, the earnings will be good and I'll be taken out of, you know, I'll make money. But for now, I'm buying all these assets that the company has for more or less what the assets are worth. That's typically the mindset of a, of a traditional value investor. We, we see in headlines, and this is something that you see in the financial media, is that there's been a rotation out of growth into value. Is that accurate or is it just kind of a headline that's made up by finance journalists? This is a bit of a pet peeve of mine, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take it first. Oh, yes. If it's, um, gr- if it's grinding your gears, we want to hear about it. <laughs> and, I, you know, and I think Day, you know, Day and I both, you know, you know we, we don't believe in these growth value constructs, you know, personally. <laughs> uh, you know, we think that this is, you know, these are factors that are made by markets and consultants and pension funds to kind of p- put people in boxes, right? You know, in that, you know, somebody can have a large cap value fund or somebody can have a small cap growth fund. And then you're in that box and you have to buy value, even if value is not doing well. Or if you're in the growth bucket, then you have to buy. I think you could do both. 
right? You can you can do value investing in the growth bucket, or you can do growth investing in the value bucket. People are saying when they say that, what the market commentators are saying is, you know, in you know in in the present context, that because rates are going up, right? Longer duration assets, which are more affected by rates going up, are not doing so well. Longer duration meaning growth companies that are not making a lot of money today, but are expected to make a lot of money in the future. So the cash flow that they produce 10 years from now is worth a lot less because rates have gone up, right? Value companies are kind of your steady eddy, produce earnings every year, produce cash flow every year, which, which even at higher rates can be discounted to much higher valuations. I think that's what they mean when they say these rotations are happening, right? Uh, again, you know, rates go decline. I mean, if, if inflation declines, rates go decline tomorrow, and maybe the market starts valuing these growth companies higher again. People shouldn't get swayed by these market narratives that get built up. I think I think they're very dangerous because, you know, people justify whatever is happening in the market by these narratives. I think that's why having a process and having a philosophy is very, very important. Are you confused about how to invest? LifeSherpa can ease the burden of having to decide for yourself. Head to lifesherpa.com.au to find out more. LifeSherpa, Australia's most affordable online financial advice. You guys seem to have very subtle and nuanced views that you want to share with the value investing community. Can you expand on that, please? Yeah. So we uh, on our Substack, we wrote a post called uh, Value Investing Revisited there. I think most of your our listeners today would have probably heard of value investing. They might have maybe read a few books on value investing, heard about heard a lot of the famous Warren Buffett quotes on investing. Right, and we all know kind of what they are, right? So most people know the basics, such as the concept of Mr. Market. I'm sure you've heard of this one. Uh, the concept that volatility is a friend that should be embraced because you want to buy stock low and you want to sell high, right? So I think all of these concepts are great places to start. But what what becomes then problematic, and this is kind of the issue we have with with this field is that people take these teachings and they become very dogmatic about them right so a lot of beginners uh, or even even people who's been in this this field for many many years right they take these warren buffett quotes and treat it as hard truths without realizing in, that in practice a lot of the, a lot of the time they these concepts are very nuanced and the thing is warren buffett himself knows all these nuances. He has thought through these nuances over his, you know, 60-year, 70-year career. But the problem is that a lot of people haven't. (laughs) They're not Warren Buffett. So we see people get burned using these concepts, even though they're supposed to help you. Uh, Even, you know, all while they think that they're following the right philosophies. You know, if I was to give you like like an analogy here, it would be kind of like, listening to a like a professional stuntsman telling you how easy it is to jump out of cars you know m- jumping out of a moving car isn't that hard but if you take it that literally and try it yourself you're going to be dead so <laughs> there, there's more to it than what they what they say so so what we did is we we kind of just gave gave like uh we call it like a practical footnote to some of these uh, most referenced value investing concepts and um, it's important that investors know for for these uh, the fact that these principles can both benefit you as well as hurt you at the same time if you don't apply them properly. Yep. Should we go through those now? Yep. Sure. Sure. Okay. Well, the first is volatility is not a risk. Yeah. You know the the, the common saying goes that uh, don't be afraid of volatility because volatility is what gives you the the chance to buy stocks at a low price. If not for volatility, how are you going to buy for a low price, right? It sounds really good on paper, but in reality, what what do we observe, right? We observe that a lot of people get burned by volatility. Forget about, you know, let, trying to take advantage of it. Just don't get burned by it. And one, one of the reasons is because price drives narrative a lot of the time, right? So I think beginner investors, you know, 
might have heard of this, but it's only when you go through the actual experience do you realize how hard it is to actually fight against volatility, right? You know, you, you buy a stock at $50. And then you think it's going to go to 100, but once it goes down to 20 or 25 and stay there for a long time, it's very, very hard to go in and uh, try to buy it, even if you think it, it could be worth a lot more in a few years. I think a lot of people are just not really taught properly to think of volatility as a risk. Uh, the problem with this is that they don't demand to be compensated for taking on that extra volatility, which is a problem. So we're not saying volatility is bad. We're saying that if you know a stock is going to be very, very volatile, you better demand to be compensated for taking on that. Yeah, no, on volatility specifically, again, it's the, it's you know, it's the markets or the stock, you know, going up and down, even though the business value may be quite stable, right? I mean, we have seen 10, 20% move in stocks. And of course, the business value is not going up and down that much, right? Mm. Uh, again, if you if you believe in the stock, you know, you can buy more when it comes down. But I think what, what we're trying to say here is that, you know, you can buy more when it comes down, and then it comes down again, and you buy more and it comes down again, and you buy more. Where do you draw that line? Right? Where do you where do you say I'm gonna I'm gonna stop buying? Maybe I'm wrong, mm. right? And and when they say is you have to be compensated, I mean you have to recognize that if you're buying something that has is volatile, you know, is volatile because maybe it has leverage uh, or 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 some other reason, then you know you have to both be compensated, as in the returns you expect from that investment should be very high, and you have to risk manage, which mean that position cannot be a very big position. It has to be a small part of your portfolio because if it's already a large part of your portfolio and it's volatile, I think, you know, it, it, it's very difficult psychologically to kind of A, take that drawdown and B, you know, buy more. I think that was a very nice thing that you said, and I just wanted to explore it for a moment, is that price drives the narrative. Can you expand on that? You know, you see the market go up. And everybody on CNBC says, oh, the market's going up because, you know, X, Y, Z. And then you see the market go down. And then everybody says, oh, the market's going down because of these reasons. Uh, but at the end of the day, there, you know, there are buyers and sellers on both sides of every transaction, right? You know, and, and this is an important point in the sense that when the stock prices are making all-time highs, most stories about that stock are very, very positive. Everybody just looks at what can go right. Nobody wants to look at what can go wrong. I mean, you can name Shopify, you can name any one of these high flyers, right? And when the stock's down in the dumps, everybody only looks at what's wrong. Okay, so you referred then in the answer to volatility about diversification. And this is another one because um, many value investors believe that diversification is not your friend. One thing that I think investors have heard a lot and Charlie Munger, you know, Warren Buffett's partner, says this a lot, which is diversification is for the know-nothing investor. It's not for the professional. So Charlie Munger has probably the, been the most vocal critic of diversification. The concept of diversification came out of the academia. This was decades ago. And at that time, it was a novel discovery, right, that diversification can help improve risk-adjusted returns of a portfolio. But over time, I think this whole concept's kind of been relegated to, to the academia, right? It, it, it not, it's not applicable to the, to the real investors in the world who really study businesses and who have conviction and who, who have really done their homework. So that's kind of the position of where diversification as a concept is today. And, and we think that this needs to be revisited in a sense that we agree with Charlie Munger that mindless diversification, just diversification for the sake of doing that alone, don't make sense. But this, this anti-diversification view, this, this has gone, been kind of pushed to an unhealthy extreme. Maybe I'll just add to you know, the point that Dave's making in the sense that you know, Buffett you know, or Munger say you know, five or eight stocks is more than diversified enough, right? And then people follow them on that, right? But again, you know, Buffett and Munger are very, very, very smart. And they make it sound very, very, very easy. A lot of people think that it's easy. And, you know, they buy random eight stocks, 
you know, the, you know, they may not be diversified in those eight stocks and think that they are diversified, right? And then maybe, the, maybe, you know, maybe these eight stocks are in technology. So they have the same kind of factor. So if technology is not in vogue, you know, in, you know, in certain quarters or years, then you can see the whole portfolio go down and the correlation on that portfolio is one, right? Because they have no real diversification. And what you need uh, is some uncorrelated stocks in there so that, for example, if technology is going down, you you know, you have some, you know, I don't know, precious metals or industrials or some other sector that's not going down as much that you can then sell to buy more of what you what's down more. But if everything's down, then what are you going to buy? This lack of diversification that and this overconfidence, you know, you know, we think can be injurious to portfolios. And I think that's the point that kind of Dave made in that article that he wrote. This blind, overconfident belief that, you know, you can replicate what Buffett has done. And we've got to realize too that um, Warren Buffett is one of those strange individuals that will read company reports for pleasure. <laughs> and that's, you that's know, right. ordinary investors are not going to be doing that, are they? And even if they are, you know, there are... You know, the CFOs of many of these companies and the the accountants are now smart enough to hide things and, and not make it very easy for the general investor to really understand these 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 statements. Mm. And when you're talking about um, diversification and having a, a very correlated portfolio just because you've chosen eight stocks at random, um, that doesn't really speak to conviction and wanting to have conviction as well. And that conviction comes from really do understanding those financial reports much more than um, you know your ordinary retail investor would. So where does conviction sit in the spectrum of the commandments of value investing? We think conviction tends to be a word that's probably overused in the investing community. Investors really love talking about their high conviction ideas, right? Conviction is always talked about as if it's it's a virtue and it's nothing else. You know, the more conviction I have, the better. But in fact, in reality, we, we kind of think of it as a double-edged sword. Far more important than talking about the ideas where you have high conviction and would be to talk about how how do you protect yourself from your own conviction right that the human brain is is very very good at creating narratives to fool yourself uh we just find balkar and i we just find it's far more constructive instead of talking about okay you know the time when my huge conviction made me so much money you know it's, it's a lot more constructive to talk about when did a big conviction lead you to believe in the wrong stock and you know importantly sometimes conviction makes you double down on the wrong stuff you think the price falls by 50 percent okay great you know chance to buy more of this stock that i really like uh but then it keeps going down 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 until you you sell at the lowest. Yeah, I like I like the meme that you had in that article. And what was it? Um, <laughs> so you're telling me that my conviction will make the stock go up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the other thing is, Mr. Market is irrational. So maybe just give us a bit more of a, a background on who Mr. Market is and where the this concept came from, and how investors need to be careful about thinking of an irrational Mr. Market. So Mr. Market is essentially a term that was coined by Benjamin Graham to kind of personify the market, right? He's essentially saying that that's the person sitting on the other side of the table and it's offering you, you know, stocks at a certain price. And then, you know, tomorrow it's a different price, the day after it's a different price. And he called Mr. Market manic depressive. I mean, it creates this, these bouts of volatility where, you know, the same asset can be offered at different prices, day one, day two, day three. You know, the, the interesting thing about the markets is, and then, you know, Buffett kind of takes it to the next logical level. And he says, Mr. Market can give you whatever offers it wants. You don't have to swing, right? Investing is a baseball game where there are no strikes, Right. It, it, it can give you Amazon at X price. It can give you Microsoft at Y price. And you can just stand there with your capital. You have to do nothing. And when Mr. Market is really depressed, that's when you swing, you know. So that's the idea. 
So um, what, what is the nuance then? Because you do talk about Mr. Market being irrational as something that investors look at, but then it's not quite as simple as it might appear on the surface. Yeah, so we think that, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with this concept itself is sound. Uh, but then again, to the point that investors take this literally uh, without thinking about the nuances. So one way is that this could really turn into a slippery slope for investors when they really start to default to the assumption that uh, Mr. Market can only be rational when it agrees with me. You know, how, how many people just think about like how many people around you, right, you know, and they can be amateur or professional investors who, who think that the market is dumb or irrational and that, you know, they're smarter. But then they, they happen to be the ones that who have lost a substantial amount of money. And I think in this case, right, they, they would have probably been better off had they defaulted to the thinking that the market is smart and that. You know, they are not the smart money. They are the dumb money. Had, if you had they come from this starting point, they might have uh, prevented themselves from doing stupid things in the market. Yeah, that's interesting that people should think of themselves as stupid and that the market is smart rather than the very opposite. That's yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 think, I think that's a very important point mm. because you know, and and it's a very nuanced point because to make money in the market, you have to have a differentiated view compared to the market, right? You have to say, right now something is priced too high or right now something is priced too wrong, right? But sometimes, you know, you think something's priced too high and it keeps going up or vice versa. And many investors kind of stubbornly stick to their views and say, you know what, I'm right, market's wrong. Eventually the market will come to my view. Mm. And I think what, what we're trying to say is, you know, maybe the market is right and maybe you are wrong. And I think at that point, when something is moving against you, instead of kind of doubling down on your position, I think for a rational investor, it makes sense to kind of go back to the drawing board and say, okay, where can I be wrong? What is the market thinking here? What am I not thinking about? Right? I think not that many investors kind of do this and more investors should. I think that's the point that, you know, they made in that article. Okay, so the last thing is wide moats. We always hear about businesses with wide moats, and that's obviously something that's protecting them from some co sort of competition. And again, it sounds it sounds like a very rational idea, but you don't think it's quite that simple? You know, the point that we're trying to make here is everybody wants to invest in a stock that uh, has a moat, meaning it has a competitive advantage, because you know, that is the only way you protect your economics, you protect your returns on equity that you make. Because, you know, you can invest in a company today, if it doesn't have a moat, a competitor comes in, takes away the economics, the stock and the earnings that you thought you had, you don't have that anymore, right? But, you know, increasingly we find that these moats, you know, companies with strong moats, these stock prices reflect that attribute. Right? It's already priced in. So, you know, you can write a long report on why, you know, this company has a big moat and, you know, therefore you should invest in the company. But I think you also have to think about to what extent is it already priced in, right? The other thing you have to think about here is if that moat is getting wider or narrower over time. I think that's the more important question rather than just finding a moat because everybody these days is trying to find the moat. So if the moat is getting wider, I think that's where you need to be versus if the moat is stagnant or getting getting narrower. And I think that's where a lot of value investors in the last kind of 15 years have, in my opinion, made some mistakes where they've invested in old economy companies, assuming that the moats will, at a minimum, stay stable, right? But what has happened with this rapid technology, uh, technological progress is those moats have narrowed very, very quickly. And when those moats narrow, the earnings power that you think the company has five years from today, they don't have that. I think that analysis and the rate of change of moat, if you will, is more important than just determining if a company has a moat or not. I think that's the point that that we tried to make in that uh, in that uh, section. Yeah, and that's quite interesting, though, because I think that's quite well reflected if you look at the composition of the top, you know, 30, 40, 50 stocks on the US market, how much they've changed since the 1980s and how few companies are still there. 
That's right. Then you would have assumed that they would have had very, very wide moats. That's correct. And, you know, this is one of kind of Buffett's exercises that he does, right? He looks at kind of beginning of every every decade and the, at the end of every decade, he looks at what the top companies are, right? And to your point, it's interesting that many of those companies change every decade. You know, therefore, I think the point is that it, it's a very difficult job to predict if a company will remain relevant and large and moated 10 years from today. And evidence is that it's very difficult and most companies don't. What do you think are some key takeaways that retail investors, small investors just starting in the markets should be taking away from this chat that we've just had? So so I think just, just observing new, uh, newer investors, uh, I think uh, one of the difference I find between difference between a professional and amateur investors is that oftentimes a professional investor has a better sense of the return expectation that he or she can expect to get in the equity market. And what I mean is that if one has a 20% return in a year, usually the pros know that that is a pretty good return. And that kind of return, you, you cannot repeat that year after year. But Oftentimes, I think, you know, newer investors don't have that context and uh, they think that kind of returns can keep happening. But if you look historically, right, equity, public equity market returns have been eight to 10 percent historically. So I think it, it's important for maybe newer investors to kind of have that set that return expectation. Right. You don't you know, expect to make life changing kind of money in, in, in this. Right. That will really alter your lifestyle because. That's kind of the formula for blowing up, just chasing those kind of returns. Um, yeah, you've got to have realistic so, expectations. And I think yeah. people who are approaching the markets for the first time suddenly think, oh, I'm going to make tons of money. It looks so easy. But um, yeah, yeah. Like, like you said, that can blow in, blow up in your face. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you'd be probably, invest- you know, you'd probably be disappointed with just knowing how low the sustainable returns are, right? That kind of returns in the public market. And Think about 10% a year for many years if you're lucky and probably more like five, probably more in single digits compounded over however many years. That's going to be your your runway. And and that's why many people now now invest just in simple index hugging ETFs because to get those kind of returns, and even Warren Buffett is recommending his own family when he passes just to invest in ETFs. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And whether 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 you pick stocks or I think whether you choose indexing, I think the important thing would be to just pick a program, an investing program that you can stick with, right? If you know that you're, you're picking stocks is not your passion, or that you know you're, you're not going to be able to dedicate a lot of time doing this, maybe the better way to go would be would be indexing. Mm. Belka, did you want to add it, add to that? Yeah, no, I think that that latter point is very important. In that, personally, I don't think that the retail investor or any investor with a computer today is at any disadvantage compared to a buy side investor or somebody who works within a hedge fund or whatever have you. The only disadvantage is time, right? I mean, can you dedicate, I mean, a a buy side analyst works 10 hours a day, you know, and, and all he or she is doing is looking at balance sheets, looking at income statements, talking to management. Uh, If you can do that, then that's perfect. But if you can't, then you know either you index or you find managers that you think have skin in the game and 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 are competent and can uh, produce decent returns for you over time. You know, th- you know that would be. But you know, if you are passionate about it and if you can dedicate some time to it, you know, then kind of my advice would be not, not, kind of not to chase narratives. You know, pick a few companies, kind of the Peter Lynch approach that you understand, that you can touch and feel, and then just. You know, stick to them, understand them. You know, have a small circle of competence, and, and just 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 invest there. And uh, presumably use that as um, a way of learning, but uh, in such a way exactly. that you're not going to blow up your whole account. Exactly. Yeah, you can't teach passion. So tell listeners where people can find you on Substack and Twitter. I believe is one of your main uh, social media spots as well. Yeah, check us out at uh, ValuePunks substack.com or uh, we also have a twitter account uh, at value punks and both balkar and i we have a uh, twitter individual twitter accounts as well uh, mine is at d-e-n-g-u-s-a 
And and Belkar, yours is? And mine is at White Falcon Camp. Day and Belka, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you. The pleasure's ours, Phil. Thanks for thanks for taking thanks the time. Thanks for having us, Phil. Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future. 